Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm here with Andrew and Manish today. Uh, just a quick introduction, Andrew is the head of our Marketplace product group that basically uh, manages all of the different uh, uh, both incentives and processes between demand and supply, in our case our drivers and our customers across multiple services. So a huge amount of uh, automation and machine learning that gets employed within Andrew's product group. Uh, Andrew recently joined us from Uber uh, previously. And uh, Manish, our head of, head of data science, uh, who manages the functional organization of data science across Gojek. Uh, thanks for being here, guys. Excited really appreciate to be here. it. Thank you. So, let's talk about buzzwords. There's so many buzzwords out there. There are conferences out there. There are entire, you know, uh, fields or, or of content built around this. There's words like AI, words like machine learning. Um, and, and all of these, I think, have an element of reality. Some people think it's the cure for all diseases in tech. Some people think that it is the, the beginning of a complete transformation in how we operate as a society. Uh, how do we kind of separate out myth from reality here? And what I wanted to throw first to you guys is to kind of talk a little bit about what are some of the misconceptions about machine learning and AI and about data science in general that you guys have discovered as you're actually executing it? Uh, I'll go first because we'll turn it over to data science next, but I, I still remember the first sort of machine learning model that I worked on. And the thing that I learned the most about that, we were doing churn prediction, this was years ago, and it was a very simple neural network. And at the time, when I started reading a lot about it, finding out the techniques that most current machine learning and data science are employing are actually quite old. And I, to me, it was something that's you know, really exploded on the scene. And when we talk about buzzwords, it is a newer buzzword and something you, you have in your mind, robots and all these kind of crazy things. But the way that we think about it and, and the basics of it are actually you know, 50 plus years old. And right before we got on air, as Manish was talking about, one of the, one of the advents that's really facilitated this explosion is increasing computational power. And so as companies mm -hmm. like Gojek and tech in general, have started amassing massive amounts of data. Uh, the ability of computers to, to let us crunch that. Is so there was nothing actually new about the concept of these automated algorithms. They just didn't have the computing power back then to actually make it as useful as it is now. There, is There right? is a certain element which is pushing the boundaries of knowledge around that. Although the core fundamentals really are, you know, something which really existed 30 years back, 40 years back. Mm. Along with the computational hardware, you know, which is able to crunch all these massive amounts of data, there is an element of how we now take, make a feedback loop on, you know, the decisions being made out of these algorithms and how we can improvise, right? Some of these were not something which we could tackle, um, you know, a few decades ago. And now we are in that position where we have these real-time streams of data. We can take an online decision and you know manipulate real time and then see how that model figures out in the open and then self-correct, right? So there is an element of self-learning as well, which is really pushing the boundaries, which is something called as reinforcement learning. And that's probably the future which you know everyone is really scared about that you know AI will take jobs, we'll all get automated and you know uh, so on and so forth. I think you, you touched on being scared about. One of the other big changes is that businesses and customers have become more comfortable with, you know, data predictive, data predicting everything in their life. When one of the reasons as well that this didn't take off a long time ago was this concept of a black box. And one of the things in business that we struggle with with all sorts of machine learning is you sort of give it a set of parameters and it gives you it gives you an answer. But how it came up with that answer is is actually a black box. And there's been a lot more, you know, a big advent in people becoming much more comfortable with the notion that 
the answer that, that's given to you from this black box is right and it's probably better than you were going to do on your own. Mm -hmm. And that the changing of mindset has, has certainly allowed this to expand massively. Well, then how do you how do you say that something is that you are utilizing machine learning? There's so many companies that say that they are leveraging machine learning, but in your definition of when does it get to the point where you say, okay, that's legit machine learning? Like what, what qualifies for that? So, I mean, machine learning has to, you know, push the, push the business metrics in some sense, because otherwise it's just an intellectual exercise for everyone, where, you know, you just take data, you take ML models, you throw at it and you get scores, but it not, it's not driving business impact, right. right? So the moment we get into the domain where we are really talking about impactful data science, is where we can use these models to you know, impact the experience of our customers or you know, drive the growth of the company or have some efficiency in you know, the way we allocate budgets or spend. And that's how we know that you know, these are successful examples where machine learning is really creating a big difference for many of these companies. Many of the companies I personally know who really struggle at really, you know, they have large data science teams, but then they are not really effective because they are not going in that direction of really integrating with the business. Because here the real art is actually the problem formulation from the business perspective, right? Models exist everywhere. You can plug in data, you can connect models to those, and you know, you get an output. But how that output really integrates with your business processes, with your particular localized domains, and then creating an impact is where the real difference comes in. And that's how you become successful. Let's break down a bit of an example of that, that yeah. sort of pipeline, right? You know, we talked about models and we talked about some more buzzwords, but is yeah. we go from, let's say, algebra on the left of A plus B and a human making all the decisions to machine learning, you know, we start with identifying something that I think one of the pieces you need to, to start using models and machine learning is a very complex problem with lots of inputs. This is not something that is, that is easily solvable. Yeah. And then we, the first step we do is we, we tackle a model. And so the first model we'll make will be kind of the simplest one we can do. And to create a model, the basic, the basic premise is we give it a ton of data and we sort of give the model an objective function whether that's providing a score. So if the three of us and we're trying to say, you know, predicting who's the tallest, maybe we would take how tall our parents were as inputs, what kind of diet we had growing up, where we were born for socioeconomic reasons. And then the model could, taking those, create a, a kind of a black box methodology to score each of those factors and give each, each of the three of us a predicted height score. And then mm. we would take that predictive height score and we would look at what the actual height of the customers were. And then we would say that model was good or that model was bad. And that's how we first sort of iterate on the creation of a model of any sort. From there, optimizing it and then eventually plug it into kind of machine learning where then it will optimize itself and it can pick up new inputs to that and, and sort of solve a more complex objective function is the pipeline that we go through. And this is something Manisha and I do a lot at work is a problem, what sort of model would we have to tackle it? And then how do we ultimately sort of automate it through the, machine learning? There seems to be two kind of themes that we keep coming across through. The first theme is actually predictive, that concept of being predictive. If you're not predicting a specific outcome, but hopefully in real time, right, so they can, then it doesn't count as if it's not really machine learning, right? So the first concept of predictive. What about then there's the other theme of self-learning yep. or self-optimization? Do these two criteria need to be met for it to be considered a legitimate machine learning model? Not necessarily. So, so there is also this myth you touched upon, you know, what kind of uh, things people are really uh, confused about when it comes to machine learning. So not every algorithm which we try and deploy in production is something which is self-learning. Right. So what we try and, you know, I, I'll, I'll revert back to what uh, Andrew's example on, you know, uh, predicting heights of people, right? Unless there is a mechanism where you know you predict a number, predict your height, for example, and you have a feedback loop that you know you try to predict, you saw how much was it off by, and then make that as a feedback you know mechanism to the model itself, and then the model kind of self corrects using that piece of information to go in the right direction and minimize that error. That's when you call you know it's self learning. Right? Because then you can leave it out in the open, it can encounter various kinds of data, and then go towards that optimized objective, or you know, the error function which we want to uh, uh, basically formulate here. So there is this also, I mean, many people confuse that, you know, a supervised learning, wherein you know what you are going to predict. Like for example, in this case, we, are, we know we are going to predict heights. 
but there can be situations where you do not know what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. So for example, one classic example is like, if a company wants to you know, make t-shirts of various sizes, right? how does it come up with what kind of size of t-shirts should it build? And then it tries to imagine like, you know, okay, this is the sample population of, you know, a particular city and then there are some unsupervised techniques, how we can actually map it to what would serve the most, you know, uh, most population's use case. So that's how you can actually club similar groups into something and it is called clustering. And that allows you to bundle your, you know, similar patterns into one bucket. Because when you, when you start off with, you don't know how many would actually fall into that criteria, right? So that is something which falls in the realm of unsupervised learning and where you do not know exactly what your outcome is going to be. And then, so this is the classical machine learning and the stuff which is really picking up pace right now is that reinforcement learning which I was touching on, where you really react open to an environment. So there has been a lot of research where bots have been able to identify their environment, navigate it without little or no training from before. So they really interact with the environment just like a human does, tries to see what that optimal path of navigation would be, does make mistakes, learns from those mistakes, and then auto-corrects that. Right. So that's more like a reinforcement learning and self. -learning. And in all honesty, even in Gojek at the size that we are today, we're still quite far away from that ability to do that, yeah. right? So there are only very few companies which can actually claim or leverage that you know, they, they actually use reinforcement learning in more of a production environment. Only maybe a few top tech companies and you know, in very few use cases, I would say. But the classical machine learning is what is you know, getting adopted much more and is really driving business impact. There are, you know, uh, research, a lot of research which happens on reinforcement learning, uh, but that's not really, you know, at a stage where we can say, you know, it's readily adoptable by you know, a there, lot of companies. There is this super crazy concept uh, that I've only learned once once uh, uh, I joined Gojek about certain machine learning models going stale or somehow having a life of its own and somehow changing uh, its own identity and its own processing feature on its own organically. And I'm very interested about that, that the fact that these things cannot just self-optimize without kind of constant love and care yeah. from the team. So I found that a very interesting, almost like lifelike characteristics of, of, of algorithms uh, within machine learning models. Can you explain a little bit how that works and how, how algorithms can kind of go rogue for example, and maybe show some examples of what you've experienced on yeah. that. We, there's certainly there's certainly no shortage of these, and I think the the root of this problem is a pretty classic startup issue, which is the launch and forget mindset. And one of the things about machine learning and algorithms is they sort of automate something that usually a person was doing previously. And it, with hyper growth companies, there's so many things to do that particularly great employees will, as soon as the thing they're working on is no longer the biggest problem, they will move to the next problem. And I think one of the one of the downsides, perhaps, with algorithms in general, and, and certainly predictive models, is if you you know you spend all this time creating a very good predictive model based on the data of let's say last year or last month, and it works, and you look at it the next month and then maybe the month after that, but at some point it becomes sort of natural human tendency to just stop looking at it, mm. and and that so that's the root cause of what happens here frequently. And then, you know, some examples that I certainly remember, and, and some, some even a Gojek that I know, is we've created models to, you know, really optimize to make sure that we are allocating our trips efficiently in ways that we know we will, we will complete the highest number. And in, in the two months that we tested it, it did a great job at that. And then the longer we let it run, we noticed that some of the ways it would do this had, you know, negative impacts on the population. And so it could for, perhaps, you know, So it was making its own trade-offs based on its own limited logic. And the way that it made the trade-offs in a small sample size that we looked at it, so during the part that we were closely monitoring it, the trade-offs looked great. But as the company grew, some of the downsides that we didn't properly measure got bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. And then eventually it became a problem where when it came back onto the radar of the people who created it, very quickly did we realize what was wrong with it. But this uh, you know, launch and forget was really what happened. Yeah. I mean, anytime you build these models, right, you are only working with a limited scope of that data set. Mm. And you have little or no control. There might be an you know, entire shift in distribution of the data going forward. There could you know, be a structural change in the market. 
which we are not really you know uh, trying to cover up with whatever variables are embedded in the model right now and that's an uncertainty which never really goes mm. so i don't think you know there are models which can claim that you know they are really bias free i mean that's a big debate in the whole machine learning community that how do you actually make models uh, which are very very generalizable and that's always a constant challenge because you don't know when these models go out on play there could be you know okay think of it like going back to the example of allocations right mm. there is entirely possible that you know the whole city planning uh, structural change could change the flow of traffic mm -hmm. roads could become one way were we accounting for that when we were creating the model probably not do we even have the information about that because it has just changed not necessarily these will eventually i mean uh, result into some or the other kind of bias which probably are you know not in the control or even in the times of modeling there are certain ways how you can actually account for that bias and now it really depends how much you know how much a priori and you know posteriori checks we do to really quantify how much of a margin of error do we have once we go in production so. I, i remember we had this constant issue whereby our systems were not good enough at handling rain right and rain was a consistent issue that keep coming up and and for some reason it was they were ill prepared to come up with the best possible outcome for a rain scenario and it required some additional modeling for it to to actually adapt and then work later on so these are not contrary to what a lot of people believe these are not just self sustaining systems that don't require care they are very very uh, needy organisms that that require constant updating require constant love and nurturing and and monitoring right and so just to kind of give some of our listeners a sense of scale about how we do this i mean we do millions of transactions a day um on the gojek platform uh, i wanted to ask andrew about you know when we book a car or a motorcycle on the gojek app How many variables do we actually factor before deciding who to give this order to and which driver to give this order to? Oh, I think that this is a great question because the answer yesterday, today and tomorrow are kind of almost exponentially increasing numbers. And so the first iteration and and the way that a lot of point-to-point -point logistics companies start is is some measure of distance, just trying to get the closest driver to customer. Right. And that can be you can do sort of ETA distance, you can do straight line distance, whatever it is. And that's the most simplistic and that has it makes tons of sense on why everything starts that way. And then you move to a slightly more complex model where maybe it's maybe it's distance plus one or two other things. Where we are today is we're using distance plus I believe and you may know the exact number, but north of 10 different characteristics. But even within those characteristics, we may have subcategories that change a little bit depending on the exact situation going on and how we do this across all of our different services. Maybe the things you want to consider for a food order and a and a go ride order are entirely different as well. And as we look to the future, which is, you know, we're currently solving today and tomorrow's problems, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to be looking at pro potentially hundreds, if not more characteristics for individual orders. So something we touched on earlier was computational power and the, you know, the the load on our systems but if we're doing millions of trips a day and each one is you know just just for the first iteration of how we allocate is currently you know tens of characteristics you can do the math that we're, we're you know we're getting close to billions of computational assessments just on how we allocate let alone prices and routing and everything that comes downstream yeah. and so and there's a huge element of personalization as well here mm -hmm. right which we try and factor in while we try to optimize the whole marketplace mm -hmm. now imagine there are certain portions in a city where it's very very hard to pick up right and we might have seen historically that you know some of these places are hard to discover and you know the etas become usually quite high what can we do to actually optimize you know in terms of allocation over there are there drivers who really get confused and end up canceling and how do we make them uh, you know uh, orders which can be completed to the maximized uh to maximize the expectations and you know experiences of our users mm -hmm. right so these are some of the little nuances which we can also address using some of these newer algorithms and you know as as andrew mentioned the number of dimensions and variables i mean we can pretty much bloat it up as much as we can and the more granular we go in terms of the features that we use for these models the the more personalized 
you know, experiences we can give to our users. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense, if you um, deviating a little bit on the recommendation side of things as well, right? Uh, what we do for the food users, we always try and cater to their historical patterns of usage. Keep recommending them. You're, you're referring to us uh, recommending to our Go Food users yes. which restaurant or which dish they might like, right? Right, and personalizing it to their specific taste. Yeah, yeah just to clarify. Sure. For the so, in terms of what kind of food preferences they have, what kind of cuisines they like, what kind of you know, um, do they really want a fast food? And that's the ETA bit of it, where you kind of try to attune your whole app based on a user's flavors and you know his his choices and the more granular i mean and the more personalization you want to add over there gives them the better experience and you know that is the aha moment which everyone is you know mm -hmm. uh, trying to optimize for so yeah I, I find that fascinating i think uh, the analogy that i heard used was that our data science initiatives on personalizing dish and and restaurant recommendations is almost akin to uh, trying to replicate the human tongue and <laughs> and right it's essentially the human tongue and the and the human hunger uh, reaction within an algorithm right because you're tracking two different things you're not on un un you're not only predicting affinity to a particular taste or a category of food which is why our tagging initiative and in GoFood is one of the biggest things and how to data tag it more specifically to the type of dish as well as that impetus of Am I hungry now? Or what time of day is it? What do I feel like during that particular time of what day? What did I have yesterday? What did I have yesterday? Yeah, yeah. What, what I generally like. And then hopefully the next step of that evolution is beginning to target you know, things like, mm, what kind of a health program am I, am I trying to achieve on these days? Am I feeling healthier today or no? Am I feeling more crispy today or more spicy today than no? And I find that food is a, is a perfect microcosm for the personalization because it's much easier to explain how would you be able to do that without machine learning yeah. because essentially the constraint that you hit is the number of variables that goes into why I decide to buy a particular food is so immense that the correlative and causative effects of those variables to my decision are way too complex for the human brain to determine right and that is we have to rely with multi variables exactly what you said but so, so where where does it where does it leave us um, um, in terms of you know the applicability of this technology, guys? Like everyone's talking about this, not just tech companies, but also like traditional companies out there are all jumping on the bandwagon of hiring data scientists, having data engineering teams. Like, when is machine learning not necessary? You know, I, it's and we we can definitely talk on some examples of when it's not necessary but i think you know the the value proposition that machine learning and algorithmically driven decisions are, are providing companies is both the automation piece which you know can do a lot of things faster than humans can as well as the improvement of key business metrics the, i love the food example because one of the things we're solving for is trying to remove the cognitive load from the customer if you open up a restaurant's menu and you've sat down in a restaurant you open the menu and I always say, I actually love restaurants that have 10 or 15 items because I don't, I don't need to be flipping pages to decide. And as we're trying, you know, we're fundamentally trying to improve the customer experience by hitting their need before they know what it is. Right. So we have this improvement in experience. And when we talk about some of the allocation pieces, we match supply and demand, we're talking about kind of efficiency improvements. So there's definitely not a set list of what can and can't be there. But the reason this is increasingly getting talked about is there are very tangible ways that businesses can save money and make more money through some of these efficiency-driven pieces, as well as actual experience improvement. And not every model does both, and usually models will probably do one or the other. But in that bullpen of experience improvement, you know, every business has a customer, and efficiency improvement, there's a whole lot of things that fit there. Hmm. Just on that point, you mentioned, you mentioned this point about not all models can be applied to everything else, right? And that in the beginning stages of our of our kind of data science journey, I was as 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 a CEO, I was super frustrated at why we couldn't have like a single master model, right? Hey, if we are matching willing users with drivers, why can't you use that same engine to match willing users and restaurants, right? And just have that as like a matching a generic uh, uh, matching algorithm that just takes into account different variables and maybe has different output metrics like for 
the food part, the output metric would be, oh, I end up converting on that restaurant. And for, for obviously for drivers and customers, the, the ride was taken and completed, right? Those are the, the key goals and objectives. I was very quickly corrected by the team that, hold on a second, generalizable models can be disastrous and generally speaking are not recommended especially when you are in the beginning stages of this evolution yeah. right I, I don't know what you guys think about that so I think you were early too that's the end state now that's where we want to get to the fewer models the best but talk about some of the technical issues on it so I mean the very first thing startups need to realize that you know when they're at the start of the journey I know there is a lot of uh, focus on you know jumping onto machine learning right at the start, right. but you really need historical data and historical data with clear signals and patterns before you even you can embark on the journey, right? So you need a you need a substantial enough amount of historical data that you can access. Yes. It's a very different. It's not just data that you store. Right. The amount of data engineering work we spent just yep. trying to make all of that data accessible and pullable. Yep. Forget about real time, just, just accessible first time was super hard, real time was even harder. So you're saying that should be the first requirement. You need to have a lot of it. And the, Otherwise, the, the one other piece on data quality is you gotta be restored, have tons of it. You know, I, I don't know what our data creation per minute is, but per hour it has to be gigabytes and daily maybe even terabytes. Yeah. But it also has to be representative of what you're trying to solve. So right. when businesses are in hyper growth, like the, the, the line you'll hear in business is past performance is not a good predictor for, for future performance. So you need to get to some point in your growth curve where your data is somewhat representative. When you're you know, 5Xing month on month, the data just you can't train models on that because it's too volatile. Right. Doing 100,000 orders per day to get to a stage where you're doing millions per day, everything changes. Everything changes. Your customers, you know, what sort of customers, how deep in the acquisition piece are you? And so your customers sort of change entirely as well. The number of restaurants you have in the food example, the whole game changes. And your model, if you trained a model all the way back here and we're still making decisions on it, the pieces you trained it on, it, it would no longer be useful. Okay, so you need a sufficient number, that's the first part, you need a sufficient amount of data that is still useful and more, uh, still relevant, relevant. The relevant to the parameters. What else do you need before you can even start embarking on this? I think, so I mean, Andrew touched on the point on the relevance of the data which you are actually tapping, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine you are trying to solve the food personalization problem, but you really do not store where users click, what they search for, and eventually what they add to the cart and then check out. Mm -hmm. Then the whole thing you know, is not necessarily something which the data science team can even start to tackle. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the very first, having the relevant features. Now after you do that, you really go through an exploratory exercise where you try and figure out, you know, try and define the problem, like I said, that's the very first start what is it that you are actually trying to solve, hmm. right? And that basically de defines the premise as to what goes into the models and what is the expected outcome. Mm -hmm. And then there is this whole exploratory exercise where we see are the models really giving us any useful patterns which are in the data, or is it just you know a random number generator which you know just is <laughs> predicting uh, like a flip of a coin or something? So. We have to make some conscious calls whether there is some underlying pattern in the data or not, and then we can see the efficacy of these models, which really start to you know um, show us some tangible results. One of the things the DMAS that we haven't answered is when when don't we use models? You know, like with times where we've done this, gone through the training, and then we looked at it and we just said you know this was no good at all. Yep. And then what are the things that we just don't at all? We don't even look at the problem as a data science solvable problem. Uh, I can give one example which hopefully has gotten better is predicting, the ability to predict churn is something that is a very common tech company problem in, in all e-commerce customer bases. But a lot of the time, what you, you can predict your churn pretty well, but then the ability to do anything about it is non-existent. And so mm -hmm. you've got this model that tells you what happened yesterday, but that is actually not all that helpful. And that, that's a personal example. You have any others? Yeah, so I mean, so going back on that part, right? Machine learning is often treated as a black box, which just gives you a score. Mm. Doesn't really tell you what's happening in the inside, mm. right? And that's where it becomes very important to, you know, depending on the problem, do you need any causal understanding, causal reasoning as to why something is happening, right? So 
that's where it becomes very important you know it doesn't really just become a black box depending on the problem that you are trying to solve mm. i mean and and then try and you know uh, formulate the problem so yeah so you do see teams spending a huge amount of investment and time trying to predict metrics that they don't necessarily understand the root cause and therefore don't know how to move it ultimately right yeah <laughs> and then you only realize that after months and months of investment and spending so i guess that's a lesson learned that the metric has got to be whatever you're trying to predict you need to already have a sense over generally the causative uh yeah. relationship with other factors yeah. so you can do something about it right based on brain so once i predict x then there has to be an action associated with which to either prevent it or increase the probability of it happening right i mean as we as we try, i mean giving an example like as we trying to minimize the etas for our customers right mm -hmm. and imagine we do not have any idea about the actual distance between the point of pickup and where the driver is right we we are not in the best position to actually optimize that because we don't have that piece of information mm -hmm. what we end up doing is we'll use a birds distance which is less you know uh, which is a haver sign distance i mean distance between the two points which is very theoretical right mm -hmm. so that is something which we, which we do not have any understanding of and how do we optimize for mm -hmm. so now that's a missing piece you know which the model can't optimize so it's very important that the feature set that we are looking at while trying to build the model really captures the whole dynamics mm. right and and that's one, one of the more essential pieces uh, sorry uh, just one more that i think about too that uh, most companies are still creating budget allocation in excel from scratch with a whole bunch of kind of c suite members and and business heads bottom up budgets right this is something it's it's very analytically driven so it's the type of thing that feels it would be great for machine learning and algorithms but very few companies are doing serious predictive sort of budget allocation for their sort of annual planning and this is a little bit not so much that the some of the issues where do you trust last year's data to make this year's decisions and data quality piece but just the size and impact of the problem you know as a ceo if someone gave you a budget and said our best data scientists worked on this algorithm and that's the budget you'd probably still have someone kind of bottoms up scrub the entire thing it's just too important yeah. to not have the ins and outs be something you can really control and that is something that data science is still still tackling this loss of control for business leaders who don't have a, a fantastically deep grasp of data science principles I, i think that's a fantastic kind of take on the importance of the output of that data science problem you're trying to solve i think a lot of people assume that data science are usually only related to for example in technology companies consumer facing issues whereby there's a huge amount of inefficiency um maybe acquiring users keeping users right really complex stuff like credit scoring all of which you know in the gojek universe we will do or will eventually do but what we don't think about enough are some of the biggest allocation planning tools because again keyword predictive right if if companies can better predict their budget <laughs> spends overspends or underspends yep. year to year with actually a huge amount of data actually every, every company has very strong accounting they yep. they know they can calculate the return on every incremental dollar spent and so on why aren't machine learning tools being deployed for non-tech purposes like the two most important resources in a technology company number one is its talent its people and how to deploy that most important and scarce resource which is talent the second thing is money right <laughs> essentially a technology company today are a combination of these two things right yep. yeah but more i would say people is a slightly uh a more important factor of allocation of resource so predicting the quality and performance of people in your from your recruitment funnel to when they're inside to how they will track over time predicting that and pr predicting churn yep. in people right why are we only predicting churn in our ecosystem players why not the most valuable players we have which are our internal employees so why aren't we predicting internal churn we spend so much time trying to predict how customers will interact with our app how will they go if they if their first ex experience with gojek was go pay how long will it take for them to take a go ride and then a go food trip but uh, the people one is another area that is largely devoid of serious data science impact not just to gojek but anywhere with maybe the exception of linkedin but you know predicting what sort of development curve your employees will be on let alone predicting churn and burnout 
Right. And, and the same with how you hire. Hiring is still today, and you've hired hundreds, if not maybe thousands of employees, but still an exceedingly manual process. You know, there are some objective measures of scores at the end of experiences, but in terms of really leveraging all the tech has to offer, both finance and, and people development internally are things that are, are lacking in DS in just about every company that I know of. We might add some more work streams to <laughs> Manisha's <laughs> <laughs> department after this. <laughs> no, but I think that that's something that, that you gotta start thinking with. What matters the most? And how can data science uh, help you solve those problems? If, if we could be, for example, we could be improving our recruitment efficiency by so much bigger if suddenly we realize that, hey, actually people who come from these companies of this age with this education background and have at least these organizational experiences have a 80% higher probability of performing and being promoted in Gojek versus others. Yep. Right? <laughs> I consider myself an okay, a pretty good interviewer and recruiter, and I couldn't even juggle two, three variables in my brain at the same time. I don't remember who I hired before, right? I don't, I don't remember where they were, everything, and all the details of their life. Yeah. An individual contribu an individual's um, historical experience captured through their CV is such a rich data point. That is. That no one actually uh, ever thinks about. And on the other side, on, on the budgeting side, I'm super fascinated by your comment as well because it's not just the planning, it's not just the predicting part. Even more importantly, I think data science can add value in the allocation part. Because mm -hmm. yep. right now, you know, big company, small company, just because you add more analysts to the budget planning process doesn't make it more scientific, right? Also, I mean, there is a component of, is that budget really realistic, right? Mm -hmm infeasible solutions yes we need to discover those yes. right and looking at historical conversions we know you know how much amount of money you spend using some marketing channel and how much conversions and you know how many signups you would eventually get right so we have a rough idea you know how the company is going to grow depending on demand or supply side how much money you put in and that's where you can leverage a bunch of features to really optimize your you know whole budgeting process and yeah, I mean, we have all seen you know, uh, great put that being put to great advantage and you know how you can actually break down your overall targets really to a very small level of let's say even cities or you know districts and then optimizing at that level. So yeah. You know, going a little bit outside of the tech sector itself because this is a topic that really, I think, uh, interests me also. I am, I am constantly amazed and surprised at how little uh, or how little governments leverage data science <laughs> in, 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 in the governance of uh, either a province, a city, or a country for that matter. When it seems to me that the problems that data science uh, 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 solutions solve is even is exponentially more important for a public institution or a government institution. I don't know what you guys thought about that. It's just the more I learn about machine learning and about data science, is it, it's almost like the most powerful tool for governments and, and, and public institutions yeah. with which to scientifically find the, the optima for whatever it is they're trying to solve. I don't know what you guys think about that. A, a very topical example now is China and credit scoring of credit or you know citizen scoring of people, Social which must score. be must yeah. be an algorithmically driven calculation based right. on a ton of input. But you, earlier, Manish kind of outlined what's required, and we can touch on those again. But high quality data, volumeless data stored efficiently, mm. and a way to access that data in, in an ecosystem that is relatively open source, I suppose, and easy to get into. And then, you know, high quality data scientists. And something we didn't touch on is an environment where you can experiment. Because part of what I love the science and data science, it is very, you know, basic in its need to experiment. Your first iteration of models is, is really good. And sometimes it's terrible. And so if you look at governments, how, how great is the data storage? Right how accessible is it even internally with the need to keep you know different sectors of the government it's very well known that 
governments are great at cross collaboration, cross communication. And then, and so those, those are real structural challenges. I think some countries do better than others, but certainly a challenge. Yeah. I think data is the, is the real bottleneck over there because many of the times, many of the government functions do not do enough to really track all the uh, variables that they would want to keep uh, in, in control. And given the part on the models and we touched upon explainability, right? Now we are talking about nations using data science and you know allocating budgets and if you have these models out there which really decide the outcome of a country it now starts to take a shape of a very strategic power right mm. almost almost like um, a, a very strategic advantage as as you know it, it almost is termed like a industri second industrial revolution right uh, ai is that wave and now governments would want to really tap in and many of those are making those strides that it really gives them that superpower status mm. right and it has the potential and you know in near future i'm sure we will see that you know there will be a certain discriminatory power some countries might face which make that stride today to actually take that leap of faith and you know invest heavily on data science and machine learning initiatives on the government and and, and, and i I, com I completely agree in the transformative effect it's just that like i'm i'm sometimes amazed like how do you actually optimize a public transportation model without data science like i i, I you I, don't. I, how can you? <laughs> and, the, and that's the point on yeah. if you don't collect that data, if the public buses do not really have something which tracks your GPS, you would not be able to. Exactly. Right? Another perfect example is um, uh, chronic illness disease management in yep. a country's mm -hmm. healthcare system, right? If, if you're not collecting all of the information from clinics, from, from, from medicine being dispersed, then how do you actually figure out if your interventions are working or the capacity of your doctor system is sufficient or whether or not uh, certain uh, behaviors or, or, or health behaviors are contributing to certain chronic illnesses versus others. I just, it, it somewhat frustrates me that these kind of things like, if, 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 I, if I were a government and there was like 100% of my recruiting budget, I would definitely spend upwards of 20, 30% on uh, data engineers and data scientists to first, let's get the data and create software that will allow, force people to actually contribute that, that data in a, in a privacy sensitive way, obviously, yeah. in, a, in a very uh, anonymized way, and, and, and be able to collect it, and then have the data scientists start, you know, at least preliminarily screening these data sets for finding some kind of correlative, uh, if not causative, uh, relationships. And I think there's, there's one kind of term that I want to kind of separate here. The first time that I learned that there were two separate kind of functions and departments, one is data engineering and one is data science, right? In the beginning of this journey, I finally realized, oh, those are two different things. So can you share a little bit about why these two groups are important to have and what's the difference between the two of them, right? So I mean, we have been talking about how the whole model is built and the very fundamental thing which you really need to have is the right amount of data in the right shape and in with the right availability, right. right? So you could have tons of data, but if it's not something you can easily pull, I mean, uh, into, you know, uh, whatever uh, language you are coding in, then it literally becomes a bottleneck in the process. So imagine the data, you have streams of data, you have offline data, you have, you know, a variety of sources of data. All that really needs to be sanitized, put in a data store, where it's really easy to play around with. Otherwise, it becomes a huge bottleneck and hurdle, right? And then you would always have these constant challenges that, you know, hey, we are not tapping these certain variables and someone has to really pick it up, right? So for example, users, how they scroll on our app. That tells a lot about, you know, the discovery aspects of what we have uh, on, on, you know, various services that we have. So we really need to start building those pipelines so that there is a constant flow of data. And then we can, as we talk about this adaptable, uh, you know, models which can, you know, be real time. If we do not have that fundamental asset which comes from that data engineering team, it really becomes a huge bottleneck for the data science team to be, you know, effective. So just to probably give some of these listeners uh, a, bit of, a bit of context as well, and how long it took us, like, even for a company like Gojek uh, at, at our scale, I would say it took us about a year, right? Mm -hmm. A full year to really get data engineering correct. And so if I'm a 
if I'm a founder of, of a, a newly growing startup, um, should I not even think about hiring data scientists until I have a very strong data engineering team? Would that would that would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I I know personally a lot of startups which have made that mistake where they actually hire, given the hype, the data science team first. Right. Whereas actually it should always be preceded with this whole data engineering setup, which needs to be uh, to a certain shape, and only then a DS team can be formed and be really effective at what they do. Mm. So yeah, I, I think. I sometimes think of data engineering and data architecture as, as a massive mall full yeah. of stores, departments, and each each store maybe sells something a little bit different. You got your clothes, you got your food, and in your food store, right, you may have thousands or hundreds of thousands of products. And part of data science and business intelligence more broadly, you know, gets to go into that mall and pick what they need to do whatever it is they do when they leave this proverbial mall. And without, without that structure and everything neat and organized, could you imagine if everything in a massive mall was just entirely on the floor all at once? <laughs> and, and then the job of the data scientist is to go and sift through it and find it. And you have you complexity of real-time data streams like Kafka and what needs to be real-time. And then what do I need to store? And what when I store things, how long do I store it? We have some government regulations that require us to store some data points for 10 years, maybe ad infinitum. And some things we maybe only store for weeks or months and then we let it go as well. And the architecture and costs associated with it too are, are no small feat. All right, so just don't, don't jump into it without doing the research, right? These are, these are some of the most expensive talent, right? Some of the most scarce talent, especially in Southeast Asia or in Asia period. Um, actually, there's scarce talent anywhere. Everywhere. In the, in, in the world. And quality data is at the core of just about every company these days. And if it's not, that company is going to struggle in the long term. And getting that, getting your engineering set up in a way that you can store the right data for the right amount of time is so critical to getting off the ground. That's an important point we actually have not touched on, data quality. Mm. Yes. I think it's always garbage in, garbage out. Even if you throw the best of the models, which are state of the art, if your data quality is really give bad. Give an example of data quality. This is something I think is, is hard. You know, if you're a customer, I got a phone. How does Gojek have issue with data quality? My phone talks to Gojek, the data is there. Talk, give an example of data quality issues so, we face. So think about aggregation or, you know, feature engineering. Feature engineering is something where we take the raw data set and we try and, you know, build something which is more, um, in some sense, it's aggregated, it's transformed, and then used in the model, right? right. Now, uh, thinking of an example, imagine that you are trying to, Think let's say, store location pings. Location data is a great one for this. Location, location yeah. of the uh, user or of the driver? Either, either one. Either, either one, ones, yeah. but, but imagine, you know, that signal is very jumpy. Right. It just keeps moving here and there, right. right? Because of the GPS chip inaccuracy in, say, lower end Android phones. Yeah, that right. you know, in big in cities with tall buildings, if you're sitting on the street level, your GPS ping to the satellites way up in, in the sky, actually, you know, they bounce off buildings, right. and then by the time they're going up in the sky, they're off. And so there, there are error rates with all of these things on how accurate these things actually are. And the system just assumes it's perfect, right? Yep. The yep. system doesn't know it's flawed. Yep. And so that's your point about garbage in yeah, and, 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 and part of the data science process, I mean, I think I missed that part earlier, is really to assess the quality of the data. Mm. Because if you do not do that, then you know you always uh, are trying to make sense out of garbage. So the analogy so, would be yeah. that the data science model sees that suddenly this, you, this driver's location pings are like popping boom, 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 and the standard deviation yep. to some of these points is so high that the, the data science uh, algorithm starts excluding those uh, data points that just don't make sense. They could just be, they're off, right? These are outliers that are off. And if the data science model doesn't do that, then our allocation system gets completely ruined because yeah. we're allocating based on actual data instead of actual accurate. And for any, any of the listeners who want to experience this, I think on WhatsApp, you can open your WhatsApp and hit share my location and they actually have your location, but it tells you the error distance in, in WhatsApp. And so if we're sitting here, if I'm sitting at my desk in, in Pasaraya, it gives me plus or minus 60 meters, which if you're thinking about a pickup street side or curbside, mm. 60 meters is a lot of meters. We're not, we're not even just across the street or down the block. Right. Sometimes I'm, I'm a couple of blocks and around the corner on the other side of a building yeah. and that's that's the raw data that comes to us. That isn't a Gojek problem. That is an infrastructure of where the satellites are and mm -hmm. tall buildings and, and
and phones and everything. And to summarize, I think the important point is to separate the noise from the signal in the data science process. Yes. That's that's really one of the fundamental uh, things we need to. So focus. garbage in, garbage out. But <laughs> so let's let's talk about. I mean, related to that point as well. You know, I think uh, for the for the listeners that don't know, um, uh, we are we are invested by Google, uh, and 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 it's been one of the most productive, I think, partnerships. Uh, we've ever done, uh, both from a product integration perspective and from a knowledge perspective. But uh, how how do you guys feel about you know the the, the future of our capabilities now that kind of uh, Google is 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 kind of a uh, 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 variety of product integrations on the back end are happening with Google and how do you think that will impact our both data science and our machine learning capabilities? Because that's super interesting and exciting. Uh, and uh, probably some of our listeners are very interested in finding out more. I think Google's role in the explosion of point-to-point -point services globally is is missed, but it will one day be a case study. And you know, to anyone who says, how is that the case? The open sourcing of map, mapping data and high quality mapping data covering almost the entire world. There are point-to-point -point services in every major city in the entire world. And I don't know what percent, but a lot of them run on top of Google Maps. It's Google has made this wonderful mapping system, open source, pretty good quality everywhere. Mm. I think that's the foundation. And what that means for us at, at Gojek is as we look to, to kind of the future world, we, we kind of get to skip the generation of having to build our own mapping data, mm. as do many companies. So then you say in a point-to-point in a -point logistics and something I think a lot about is when the mapping data is the same, Gojek's using Google Maps, a lot of other people are using Google Maps, where do we find our advantages? And you know, we've touched a lot on improving the customer experience and, and customer data, but I think increasingly what it means is that we'll get to focus our data science efforts and our product management and engineering efforts on leveraging the Gojek specific data we own to improve the experience and not working on you know, trying to beat Google Maps and the quality of ETAs and distances and those sort of things, as that, that ultimately is going to be a challenge for anybody. So uh, you know, the answer to that question for me is customer data. I'm sure Manish has a take. Yeah, I mean, think about it from an optimizing this whole demand and supply situation, right? What is the most, I mean, speaking from customer experience perspective, we have our own personalization models which we try to optimize for and you know, uh, build a score on how customers want to get trips. But then the strategic advantage, which Andrew was mentioning about as well, is how do we smoothen their experiences, right? How do we use traffic information? How do we use much bigger distance matrices to actually sort and find you the best driver which is available mm -hmm. at a certain point, right? And then internally, we have a lot of personalization uh, which we have touched upon earlier, how we try to optimize some of the user experiences, what are their preferences, even on trips. And that just, you know, I think that collaboration gives us a synergy where we can go much beyond. And I'll, uh, I'll give an example, and we're not there yet, but something I dream about is, you know, uh, not going to speak for you and your transportation needs, but I assume you probably take a Gojek to and from work most days that you're in Jakarta. Every day. Every day. And you know you probably leave about the same time and you probably go home about the same time, but sometimes there may not be cars or bikes where you live. And so in a world where we're able to use our historical data to predict where we will need cars and where demand will be at a future point, we can then start using all of that predictive, the historical data to predict what the needs of customers will be in you know, one hour in the future, one minute in the future. And by using that data, when we make decisions right in this moment, we can take into account, oh, but we will actually need a car in that area in the next five minutes. And so while we were going to offer a trip you know, that was 10, 15 minutes away, it's actually gonna be a better experience for both customers if we, if we offer that to someone else who's closer to this trip. And then you know, we know it's going to happen in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. and so using this voluminous historical data to predict and then improving the experience through predicting. Yeah, I, I, I can't think of a more powerful combination, actually, in terms of a from a data perspective between Gojek and Google uh, in this region. I think that's one of the things that I can confidently say is one of the most transformative things that we can do. Right? I mean, just just for example, going back to the the public service model of a transportation model, say in Jakarta, which is so complex and has so many infrastructure changes, like the amount of data and, 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 and ability to actually use that data into insights between Google and Gojek just for a public transit system like those are those are sufficient data points with which to be able to give really important recommendations to governments institutions 
uh, and, and public transport entities. And we that, haven't even touched on that, but the value that Gojek has to, to governments all over Southeast Asia is, is instrumental, helping them plan you know, future, future things as well as identifying current problems in infrastructure. That's we right. know we can highlight intersections where traffic's, traffic accidents happen too much, where people have to stop very quickly. All of these things, we have a big role to play in that in the future as well. Also, as this whole ride-sharing market is on the rise, right, many of the users are now choosing convenience over maybe some of these public uh, transportation systems. What that means is fundamentally this whole city is changing its traffic patterns at a very fundamental level. Yes. Are governments really at a stage where they can, you know, because some of the city has to change to this change in behavior as well, right? So for example, certain uh, buildings have a much higher peak of uh, cars coming in on the pickup zone, and maybe that needs an extension, right? And they need to either have multiple pickup points or you know those kind of changes. Mm -hmm. So all those information currently kind of not uh, gets utilized, and I think also at a very fundamental level, how the whole city moves and how you can optimize looking at all these various modes of transport is something you know uh, which which adds a lot of. Uh, value to the government. Absolutely. Well, let's hope that in the future we can actually have more time to actually help not only uh, 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 our own company but also other public institutions because just the sheer capabilities that we have, it would be a shame if it wasn't shared with the rest of the world and it was just, you know, for, for our company's success, which does help a lot of people, but at the same time thinking beyond that I think is going to be one of the biggest sources of motivations for our employees. Uh, and the partnerships that we strike. Guys, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having See me. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.